Dear loved ones, welcome to our Sunday service. I hope wherever you are, you're in perfect health and you're enjoying this beautiful season. And today we uh, are gathered together in this virtual space and yet uh, a time and opportunity for us to hear the Word of God. So before we do that, let us pray and ask the Lord to be present in our conversation and the points that we will be studying in the Word of God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. And we thank you that you're a faithful God and you're always looking after us because we're your children by the virtue of the work of the Lord Jesus on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that you saved us from a horrible future, a terrible uh, fate that we were facing and you brought us into your family. You washed us with the blood of the Lord Jesus and through his resurrection and the Holy Spirit have given us a new life, a new hope and a new future. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this time. I pray for all my brothers and sisters, wherever they are around the world, uh, you bless them and make this word a source of encouragement, a source of strength for each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. My brothers and sisters, our friends, I want to talk to you about a topic that we have spoken about it many, many times. Uh, our church, the Church on the Rock, uh, is notorious in uh, making sure that we understand uh, the principles and the revelations of God and His plan and purpose in the Word of God. And what I'm sharing with you today is perhaps not very new, and yet there might be some new angles to it. And I call this message, it's all about life. It's all about life. So I'm sure you know, if you go to our archives of many years, you would find that we've spoken about this life, uh, this divine life, this supernatural life, many, many times. I'm not saying something that is brand new, it's all basically the continuation of what we have heard for all these years. But I'm going to take it around and uh, take it and twist it a little bit in a different angle so we can look at this life like you would look at a diamond. This diamond you can look from different angles because of the cuts. The reflection of that light would be somewhat different. To start with, it's important that we remind ourselves that the, one of the main themes, if not the main theme of the Bible, is about life. Life is the very first thing that God does in the Bible. Because you read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, why would he go through all that uh, experiment or effort if we can call it an effort, to create a universe, to create uh, galaxies, to create solar systems, to create our sun <clears throat> and the planets and the moons and whatever. Why? Well, you can see in the following verses that God creates the earth and all, all that is in the universe for the express purpose of placing life on this planet and perhaps one day in other parts of the universe as well. Life is the main theme of the Bible. The Bible begins with life created on a planet and the life and the Bible ends with a life that is now everlasting and forever in a very different formation, in a different uh, constitution. But nevertheless, from beginning to end, the Bible is about life. That's the main theme of the Bible. It begins with life appearing on a dead and empty planet. And all throughout the Bible, from the second page of the book of Genesis to the very end of the Bible, there is a battle going on between life and death in many and various dimensions. As we know, and the Bible tells us, <clears throat> there is a destructive force in rebellion, in opposition to God, 
who is attempting and which is attempting to do one thing and that is to disrupt that is to stop and that is to destroy every and any trace of life that can be found on earth and perhaps in the universe that satanic force has one purpose and one goal in mind and that is to destroy life and of course the most important type of life that this satanic force is after is the life that is in a very special creature called humans satan wants to destroy humans and god of course has a great plan for these humans which starts with giving them physical life pay attention god begins his plan for humanity by giving them physical life and then ultimately god had in mind and wanted humanity to enjoy not only the physical life but also a spiritual life so man was created to be a physical being and a spiritual being and ultimately in complete unity of the physical and the spiritual life man would become what god had always desired to have a vessel to have a being that would fully and completely and absolutely express and manifest and represent God in the universe. We all know this. We've heard this many times in the teachings. So <clears throat> the battle between life and death takes place in many different arenas. In the physical life of humans, in the mental life of humans, and of course in the spiritual life of humans. So Satan very smartly attempted to uh, block and become an obstacle for man to move from a physical life to a spiritual life. That tree of life in the Garden of Eden was the gateway into a spiritual life. Because man was already a physical life, walking and living on this planet in that so-called Garden of Eden. And all he needed to do was to reach out and take the source of spiritual life. And had they done that, they would have become a very complete physical, mental, and spiritual being and would have defeated all the plans that Satan had in opposition to God. And of course, Satan stopped that. He interfered and did not allow man to move beyond the physical life into the spiritual life. And God had said, physical life without the spiritual life will die. It cannot survive. It's incomplete. It's imperfect. And therefore, mankind was stopped in its tracks in the pursuit of that spiritual life and began to experience what we call death. In the spiritual life, he was already dead because he did not have the spiritual life needed to survive and exist. That affected his mind. The mind of man deteriorates and ultimately the body deteriorates and man returns to the very elements from which he was taken. So we're looking at life as it was meant to be. And as we look at that, we see uh, that, you know, over the last few years, our pastor and our elders have shared various aspects of this life in different word definitions or attributes of this life. Do you remember for all these years, we've talked about dominion and authority that we've talked about glory, we've talked about the presence, we've talked about the, the corporateness. Um, all of these define ultimately one thing, life. They define life to us. So when we talk about glory, when we talk about presence, when we talk about uh, authority and dominion, we're defining and we're describing some attributes, some characteristics of this particular life. It is life that has glory. It is life that has dominion. It is life that has presence. Even in the physical realm, even in the physical realm, all of these attributes, to some extent, imperfectly exist. The human life, the physical hu life of a human, has glory. In the Word of God says, the glory of this 
human without God is temporal. It is temporary. It's like a plant that grows and then withers. But there is a glory to it. Look at the life of humans today and history. There have been some glorious reflections of the human life. There is presence, obviously very limited because of space and time, but life as we know it, whether it is physical or spiritual, has some of these attributes. Of course, in the physical uh, part of life, it's everything is limited, everything is temporal because we're subject to time and space. But in the spiritual life, the glory, the presence, the dominion, uh, the corporateness, everything is fully and perfectly manifested. So I want to talk about one of these uh, elements and one of these attributes of life, which is direction. Not only life has glory, has a presence, has uh, corporateness, has authority and dominion, but life has a direction. And I want to talk about that direction today. Uh, there are no, and particularly in the biblical uh, sense, there is no directionless life. Life as a general rule, even in biology, even in all the studies of life on this planet, every life has a direction. And I want to talk about that today with you. So every life appears because something in its inner constitution demands movement in a specific direction. Every life that appears on this planet has in its being, uh, in its constitution, a, an inner setup, an inner arrangement that takes this life from the moment it appears in a specific direction. Any life form, if you trace it from its start, you would see this life as soon as it is formed and as soon as it appears, begins to act and to live according to a specific direction that has been programmed in its very molecules. When a baby is formed in the womb of the mother, the moment those two cells unite to form a one common cell, which is the beginning of the life of a human, guess what? It seems, and very amazingly, that first cell knows what it's supposed to do and automatically begins to expand, to multiply, and to grow, and moves in a specific direction as though someone has sat down and programmed all our genes so that they know exactly how to form a human being. Ultimately, the goal of every cell, the goal of every chromosome, the goal of every gene is to work together in the direction of forming this human being that's supposed to be incubated for nine months, and after nine months it enters a new world, and that is what the program is. The human life is programmed by genes. So, Everything looks like it's programmed. Well, the programming happens because every life, no matter what kind of life you look, is subject to certain laws. Laws govern the actions, the movement, and the direction of the life. So there are many laws in the Bible. I would suggest you uh, maybe one time make it a study to see how many laws there are in the Bible. I just mentioned a few of them that specifically the Bible calls them a law. Well, in Romans chapter 7, uh, Paul says the law of my mind. So I guess our mental capacity and our thinking is subject to certain laws. Then in Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, he says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And also he mentions another law, the law of of sin and death. <clears throat> These are laws. Laws by definition are principles or facts or truths that have been proven and established and cannot be changed and they operate on the basis of the direction that they have. For instance, the law of gravity, it's a law. It's not a theory. 
it's not a speculation. When you say gravity, it means the law of gravity, which means every time, no matter how many, how many billions of times you take a ball in your hand and you throw it out, you would see that the ball will always go in one direction, and that is the direction of going down. Why? Because gravity has a law which says it is going to attract that object towards itself. It pulls it towards itself. So uh, in Romans, as I mentioned, in chapter 8, verse 2, we see two uh, laws opposing each other, standing in opposite of each other. If we read Romans chapter 8, verse 2, it says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. So there are two laws standing opposed to each other. So I want to focus today on that first law, which is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I don't need to talk about the law of sin and death. You know how it works. We all have experienced it and we do all every moment, just like gravity is acting on our bodies 24 seven without any stopping. The law of sin and death is working, trying to pull us down, trying to ab absorb us down into a level of being distant from God, not knowing God, and everything else that it carries with itself. So I want to talk about the positive side, which is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Well, let me go back to one of my favorite books, uh, which I keep going back, and no matter how many times I read this book, there's always something new in it. And that is the book of Genesis. Book of Genesis for me has been an eye opener. I guess because it is the beginning of everything there. And uh, I keep going back there because the Lord somehow enlightens me to see some additional truths all hidden in those chapters and verses in the book of Genesis. If you remember a few weeks ago, uh, I spoke about the life of Abraham, that what happened to Abraham and what the working out or the outworking or the, uh, the practical uh, inner working of that life in the life of Abraham resulted in what? You can go back to that series. I think it was two sermons I preached about Abraham. So I want to go back to Abraham again and take it from a, a little bit of a new angle on the life of Abraham. When we look at the life of Abraham, our pastor talked about this life in a conference called From Call to Reward. Um, and uh, he talked about the four stages of the life of Abraham. That was the calling, the training, the testing, and the reward. I want to take a little bit of that and show you something that I thought it was very interesting for me. I'm going to share that with you. So when we look at the life of Abraham, Abraham shows us the birth of a new life in type as he receives a call to leave where he was born to where he would ultimately go and settle down. So the life of Abraham, really the history of Abraham has two parts. Abraham of the Ur of Chaldeans and Abraham after the Ur of Chaldeans. So uh, that the, it, the, the distance between these two histories is what happened when Stephen in chapter 7 of the book of Acts says, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. So when God appeared to Abraham, he not only appeared several times throughout the life of Abraham, but the very beginning of the life and the history of Abraham begins with an appearance of God of glory. The Bible doesn't say how it was, when it happened, but we know for sure that Abraham, who was a very, very wealthy family, of well, very wealthy family and lived in a very civilized city, the uh, kingdom of uh, Chaldeans, Ur, God pulled him out. Well, in type, Abraham shows us that there is a new life awaiting us once God calls us to himself and once we are leaving our birthplace in a direction of a new place. That is a type of how 
we initiate and how we're initiated into this new life. Abraham for 70 some years had lived in Ur and all of a sudden God of glory appears to him and moves him out of the Ur of Chaldeans. You see, when you and I lived our lives for so many years, it could be 15 years, it could be 30 years, it depends when you became a Christian. At that moment, what do you think happened to you? What do you think new birth is? What do you think born again is? What do you think salvation or being saved is? It cannot be anything but the God of glory appearing to us. We may not see lights and thunders and, you know, uh, all these uh, uh, amazing natural or supernatural occurrences. None of that. But for sure you have to know one thing. You cannot be saved unless God comes to you unless the God of glory appears to you. Now, you may not see it with your human eyes, but your spiritual eyes that were blind, that you were dead in your spirit, all of a sudden they sense the presence of God as he touches our spiritual eyes, as he commands our our lifeless dead spirit to come back to life. And that is the moment that we have received a call to live. Abraham received the call to live, not in the Ur of Chaldeans, but in a distant land. And that hearing and that moving out of the Ur of Chaldeans was because the God of glory had appeared to Abraham. And Abraham was sure that this was not the life he was supposed to live for the rest of his days. He was supposed to go to a different land. The moment the gospel reaches our spirit, the moment the words of Christ reach our spirit, our dead spirit is brought to life, our blind eyes are open, our deaf ears are open, and we respond by stepping in faith into a new life, and that is the beginning of that life for each and every one of us. You see, His birthplace represented a rejected place where God could not and would not do anything there. God does not do anything in the realm of death. God cannot do anything where death is reigning. God rejects death. God is opposing death. And that's why God is not directly interfering in the affairs of the world today. Because this world is dead as far as God is concerned. God is not going to do anything to make a country or a republic or a kingdom a better place on this earth. God is not going to do anything to make one part of the world better and every part the rest of the world to live in misery and in sin. There is no such thing. God cannot and would not do anything where death is the dominant principle in that realm. And therefore, God is not coming to make Abraham wealthy in Ur. God is not coming to bless Abraham in Ur. God is going to first pull Abraham out in order to be able to do whatever he needs to do to make Abraham worthy of all that wealth and blessing and all the promises. To receive God's promises, Abraham needed to be pulled out. For Israel to be a nation under God, to be the chosen nation, they needed to come out of Egypt. For us to be the church of Jesus Christ, the co-heirs with Christ, the the recipients of all, all the heavenly blessings, we first need to be brought out of the world And that's why our name is Ecclesia, which means the called out ones. So God does not do anything on the ground of death. So Abraham leaves the ground of death to pursue what God has promised. That is the moment you and I are born again. We are brought out of the ground of death. And God says, now I have a plan and a purpose for you. I'm going to show you where to go, what to do and what you will get. So life is awaiting in its full blessings for Abraham because God told him, if you leave your land, I will bless you. I will give you kings that would come from you. I would make you a blessing to all nations and all the promises that you read. But that life once begins, it's not without challenges. 
If you remember, I said Abraham had received this life by calling and was supposed to, by faith, leave the Ur of Chaldeans. He received a life by calling that was new and full of promises. When God saves us, he gives us a new life full of promises. There are no promises and blessings in the old life. The life that is based on the principle of the law of sin and death cannot receive any blessings, any promises, anything from God. We first must abandon that and begin to live in that new life. Abraham not only had a new life, but he now had to live that life. You remember I talked about not only having the life, but living the life. He had to experience this life in all its power and all its aspects. You see, I can give you something new, a gift, and you can just take the gift and put it in a closet, or put it on a shelf, or put it on a table. But that defeats the purpose, because the gift is given to live the gift, to experience the gift. Just imagine I give someone a cologne or a perfume, and they keep it in that box, and for years they don't open it. Well, they have the gift, they have the perfume, but have they worn it? Have they put it on themselves? Have they smelled it? Have they experienced it? That life is like a perfume. God gives us the precious life of Christ all together in a package through the Holy Spirit. And he says, now that you've got the gift, you got to live the life. So Abraham had received the life, but he had to live the life. And that took a lot, very long, long time. Well, you see, the things that he had to experience in this 25 years or so in this life, I just named a few. He had to experience that this life was a life of provision. God would provide. Not only one time at the Mount Moriah, but throughout. This life was a life of protection. God would protect Abraham as he would be walking in this life towards that ultimate goal. You see, that God, that life was a life of progression. Abraham had to progress from step to step from his experience and knowledge of God progressively going forward. And of course, that life also was a life of resurrection, where everything that man would touch and everything of man would die, but God would raise something new and wonderful as a result of that loss that Abraham was to experience. So it took 25 years approximately for this life to be lived and to be experienced by Abraham. So what kept Abraham going? If it was you and me, would we have gone 25 years with all these challenges, with all these problems? And Abraham's problems were not small. He had huge problems. <clears throat> would we go as Abraham went? What kept Abraham going? He did fail many times, but he never gave up. He made mistakes in his life but he never stopped going forward. The secret was that what that life had done in Abraham. The secret to his persistency and his survival and moving onward and onward was what that life did in Abraham. You see, life that was in Abraham, in type, we're speaking in type, made Abraham to know God. The God he had heard and a God he had trusted from the very beginning, now he came to know that God. Many times we trust God and we take a step forward and yet God says, you know what, I don't want you to blindly trust me. I don't think God likes blind trust, even though we say, you know, blind faith. I don't think he likes that. It may be that in the beginning, we have to take a step of faith, not knowing everything, 
But as we step into our spiritual life and step forward progressively, we will come to know him. And that's what God wants. God wants to know him, not just blindly walk because he said so. He wants us to know him. And the way he's going to have us know him is by living. That's why sometimes it's funny how people misinterpreted knowing God by meaning to become uh, isolated and distant from humans and civilization and basically um, become hermits, hiding mountains in monasteries. That's not what God wants. God wants us to live, and in the midst of that living, even though we'll make mistakes, even though we may fail, yet we will continue to know him more and more. And that's what happened in the life of Abraham. So I wrote something here that I don't know if anyone else has written this before, but I thought it was cool. I wrote here, to live is to know him, and to know him is to live. I'll repeat it one more time. Maybe we can make a slogan out of it. To live is to know him. That's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him. To live is to know him. To know him is to live. How did he live that life? Well, Abraham lived that life through experiences. You see, that's why we keep telling you that experiences are very important in our lives. We're not supposed to become theologians. We're not supposed to become scientists of the Bible, that we know every verse, we know every theology, we know everything, and we can verbatim quote every theologian's writings. That's not what really constitutes experience. Why do you think God allows us to go through all kinds of experiences, good and supposedly some bad ones. It's all because the only way we can know him is to be placed in circumstances that he can reveal to us who he really is and how faithful he is and his promises and his plans for us. That's the only reason we go through all the experiences of life. If God wanted us to only receive life, and that's it, and not to live that life, the moment you and I became a Christian, he would just rapture us to heaven and say, great, you got your gift, now you can live with me forever. Do you think that would be much of a fun and satisfying life? That we really don't know him, but we're now in, pre in the presence of him, and we don't really know who he is, just because we received his life, and now we're raptured into heaven to live with him. God says, you know what? I'm going to give you the gift of life, and then I want you to live that life, and I want you to know me by living that life. So when you come to me one day, at least according to the years of your life, and what you were able to and capable of, you've come to know me. You're going to enjoy what you and I are going to have in the future. So, He summarizes all is his, God summarizes, and so does Abraham, all the experiences that he goes through by using names. You remember our pastor recently talked about the name. Well, what, does, what do those names represent? He did explain to us, but I'll remind you. Every name represents a series of experiences. A history. You see, when you want to wrap up a history or a segment of history, then you would choose a name for that history. I'll give you an example. When the Soviet Union put a wall around Berlin after the Second World War and put a uh, barrier in all the Eastern European countries uh, against the Western European countries, guess what? 
all that history that took a few years was converted into one phrase, the Cold War. When we say the Cold War, we know everything that it, me it, it means to convey to us. A war of not bombs and nuclear weapons, but a Cold War where everything is just standing in front of each other and blocking each other and animosity to uh, cut off all connection and all relationships. So the life of Abraham has parts of his history that are named by a name from God. These names represent history. These names represent history. Abraham's history is summarized by a few of these names. Abraham received life. He lived the life to the fullest, but life is not lived for the sake of just having lived it. That's another point. Abraham received this life. Abraham lived the life. Abraham lived the life in the fullest with all its challenges, with all its failures, with all its mistakes, ultimately to the fullness that God had designed and desired for Abraham. Abraham reached it. He lived it. But is that supposed to be the ending? Did he live that life just for the sake of having lived it? Or there is something else that was really the mind of God in the life of Abraham? Well, I going to tell you, yes, there was something else. Life not only has to be lived, but as I said in the beginning, it must have a direction, a purpose. I started by saying I want to talk about the direction of life. That is where we come to what started, what we started by saying that life has a specific direction. It leads to something or somewhere more above, beyond what we think is the life that we're supposed to live. What is the direction of the divine life as manifested in Jesus Christ and later in us? What is that direction? Well, the direction of, of that life, and I want to tell you this, that was a great reminder to me and perhaps a new light in my understanding of this divine life. This divine life is given to us to move in a certain direction. It's a specific direction, is a set direction. It's a predetermined direction. It cannot be changed. It cannot be modified. It cannot be anything but what this life has been designed for that this life is, and that is the direction of sonship. The direction of the divine life is sonship. The goal of the divine life is sonship. All the other terms that we've studied in the church, like glory, the presence, uh, reigning and dominion and ruling, they're all also related to this term sonship. Because in sonship you have the dominion, in sonship you have the glory, in sonship you have the presence, in sonship you have the corporate mindedness. Everything is also in sonship. Sonship is the ultimate direction and the goal of this divine life. The divine life has been from eternity past to eternity future about sonship. I challenge you to tell me something other than this. Sonship has been in the mind of God from eternity past to eternity future. It moves and works this life in one direction, sonship. Sonship is the essence of God's mind and plan for man. God was created to attain sonship. Man was created to experience sonship. Man was created to reside in the glory and the presence and the power and the dominion that is in sonship. The New Testament perfectly reveals this to us as we look at the life of Christ from the very conception 
to his death and resurrection and ascension. It was all about sonship. Sonship is it. It's the goal of that life. His conception and birth was to reveal the principle of sonship. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulder. That's dominion. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The glory and the presence is right there. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace and on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. You see, his birth was to reveal to us the principle by which God brings forth his son into the world. His life was to demonstrate the principle of sonship. One of the best books in the New Testament as a matter of fact, in the entire Bible, one of the best books, if not the best book, to reveal the principle of sonship and the practical demonstration of the principle of, the, of sonship is the book of Hebrews. What do you think Hebrews is written for? It is to show the believers the principle of sonship, the position of the son, the calling of the son, the discipline of the son, the glory that follows the perfection of the Son and the sons. His death and resurrection proved the principle of sonship. A son cannot die and remain dead. A son is a son of resurrection. The power of resurrection is in sonship. The holiness of God is in the sonship. The righteousness of God is in the sonship. Everything about what God thinks and acts and wants and desires is all collected together in sonship. His death and resurrection proved the principle of sonship. His ascension and glorification in heaven was to magnify the principle of sonship. Everything about Christ from conception to his glorification was about the principle of sonship. Everything about Jesus from start to end was about sonship. You see, life has a direction. This divine life has a direction. And it moves towards sonship. It needs to go to sonship. It will go to sonship because the sonship is the ultimate goal that God has in mind for his children. The natural direction of this divine life is sonship. You leave this life alone, you release this life, it will move automatically by itself towards sonship. We don't need to manufacture this direction. We don't need to manufacture this direction by our own, our own efforts. Try to, try to, cannot. You see, that life is programmed to go to sonship. Just like human life is programmed at the moment of conception to create a big person, a big human. A small cell becomes a big human. Well, this divine life, the moment it enters our life, is programmed to take us to sonship in the likeness of the sonship according and exactly a duplication of the sonship that was in Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of Man. We become sons to our Heavenly Father in the likeness and in the image of the Son who lived, who existed, who is operating on the basis of the principle of sonship. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, And he gave us the authority or the rights to be the children of God, not by blood, nor by the will of man, nor by the uh, efforts of others, but 
that were born of God. The moment we're born, that life is programmed, says, I've got to take this person into sonship. I have to take this girl, this boy, this man, this woman to sonship. The job of this life, the mission of this life, the power of this life is only for one thing, to take that vessel that the life has been placed in to sonship. Don't need to do anything about it. That life in itself already has the program. It knows where to go. It knows how to do it because the Spirit of God is the power that is in that life. And the Spirit of God knows exactly if He did that in the life of a human called the Jesus of Nazareth, from the human perspective of Christ, He will do the same thing in your life and my life. So, I want to make this part one, and there's a part two next week. In this part one, I showed you that life has a direction, life has a goal, and naturally this life is programmed to take us to sonship. And sonship is the principle by which God has created the entire universe. Sonship is what God had in mind, and sonship is our inheritance, our calling, our share, and our destiny. So Abraham had this life, he lived the life, he walked in this life, he f- experienced everything in this life for the purposes of what? Just living it and having lived it? No. Abraham lived it so that it would lead into sonship. You see, this life must lead to sonship. And in the life of Abraham, his life, the history that he went through led to sonship. And you know what? That sonship was in the life of Abraham. Enter Isaac. Abraham and Isaac are attached to each other. Abraham must lead to Isaac. Abraham has to produce Isaac. He cannot. If Abraham never had another child, you would say, well, all this time, all these efforts, all these training and knowledge and experiences with God were useless because it resulted in nothing. And yet God wanted Abraham to live, to learn, and then at some point it would finally lead into the principle of sonship, which is typified here by the person of Isaac. So we're going to stop here next time in continuation of this. It's all about life. Part two, we're going to look at the life of Isaac in conjunction in connection with Abraham as to how faith and how life will ultimately invariably lead to sonship, which is demonstrated in Isaac. So we'll see you next time with part two of this message. It's all about life and God bless you. 